How do you deal with food when it comes to stress? For example, you've had a fight with somebody. What do you do? Do you come back home, reach into that freezer, grab that tub of ice cream, and then you need to sit and eat it until you feel, okay, fine, now I'm calm, I can deal with the situation. Or else, does stress make you actually lose your appetite? This is known as an eating behavior. Eating behaviors are how we deal with food in response to our emotions, in response to our physical health, or also in response to our surroundings. Welcome to the Wellberry. And the discussion for today is eating behaviors and how it impacts our health. And for this, we have with us Dr. Saumita Adhikari, who is a pediatrician located in the UK. And we also have with us Alex Ginsberg, who is a functional nutritionist and also an expert on eating behaviors. And she joins us from Switzerland. But before that, if you find this video helpful, then do share it with somebody. You could also go ahead and click on that like and subscribe button because that will help our channel grow. And also the disclaimer that this video is not a medical consultation. We are here as people who want to educate you about food and nutrition. If you do have any health issues, then do consult with a physician or a nutritionist for guidance. Now, before we get into the panel discussion, it's important for us to know what are the main kinds of eating behaviors. The first is fuel eating. Fuel eating is where the person eats food because they need energy and they need nutrients, right? That's the normal kind of eating. We depend on food only for our energy and nutrient requirements. The second kind of eating pattern is fun eating. Fun eating is like, I like ice cream, so once in a while I'm going to treat myself to an ice cream because it tickles my taste buds and I feel good after that. But I don't overdo it. And then you have something called fog eating. Fog eating is a kind of mindless eating, right? So it's like when we sit down to watch a movie and we need to keep having popcorn. I have also worked with clients who tell me that they need to have a plate of chips on their side when they're sitting down to work. There are students who need to have something to munch on while they're studying. So while we do fog eating, we are not usually mindful of what we are eating or even the taste or the quantity of what we are eating. And the final one is what I first described, storm eating. Storm eating is our body's response to distress. So it could be that we have deadlines. It could be that we had a fight with somebody. It could be that there is a major emergency that has come up. And the only thing that appeals to us at that point of time is to sit down and eat. And usually the kind of foods that we sit down and eat are junk food. The purpose of this discussion is to help parents of young children and also adults for themselves recognize what unhealthy eating behaviors are all about. And obviously, if they recognize it, then they have enough reason to go and address it with their physician or with their nutritionist, right? So without further delay, I welcome both Alex and Dr. Samyata. Welcome both of you to the Wellberry. And I really hope that we have a fruitful discussion, which is going to be helpful for our viewers. So Alex, let's start off with you. Can you explain to our audience what a normal eating behavior is like? So if we need to first understand what is abnormal eating behaviors, we need to first know what is normal, right? So yeah, we'll start with you. Yes. Um, so a normal eating behavior, uh, both in adults and in children, um, is characterized by, by habits that are uh, the following. For example, it is eating at meals, uh, meals at regular hours, sitting at a table uh, for the whole duration of the meal. So enjoying the food, chewing, taking the time mindfully to appreciate what we're eating. And it's there is uh, no eating in between meals or when one is shopping, as soon as one is in front of the TV, in need of eating something or at the movies um, or studying. So it is really having a break time in between uh, each meal of a five, six hours so that the body has time to digest. Um, it's also obviously um, there is no continuous eating. Some people could eat all day long, like picky eaters and uh, you know, small quantities all day long. That is not a normal eating behavior. 
um, we there's also the 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 um, a society concept in a normal eating behavior that means that the person can feel its society and stops eating after a, qu a normal quantity of food um and uh, not uh, finishing eating when one feels like bloated or painful or having eaten too much and really tired. Uh, so that would be um, also a result of uh, abnormal, of not uh, normal eating behaviors. Uh, finally, of course, craving has to be mentioned. Um, in a normal eating behavior, there shouldn't be any craving during the day or in the evening before bedtime, etc. So globally, it's having meal uh, preparation, having it at a table at specific hours with nice interruptions in between and enjoying the food that we're eating, having pleasure with it. Okay. So Amita, when it comes to you, you and your work with children, uh, is there something else or is there anything else that you want to add in terms of what parents need to look for when they're looking at are their children eating you know, normally? What's a normal... What would you define as normal eating behavior in children? Like what we usually say is like uh, every two or three hours, uh, a drink or a snack uh, or about five to six times uh, meal times, you know, per day. So which comes to about three meals and about two snack uh, in a day. And uh, as Alex mentioned, you know, sitting on the table fam and the meals, regular family meals. And on top of that, uh, probably uh, eating, you know, a mix of the vegetables and uh, your um, high fiber, whole grain uh, breads, which is about two to three servings, three or more. And then a uh, varied quantity of vegetables of different colored, like, you know, greens with your peppers, tomatoes, uh, the carrots, and also, you know, a variety of fruits, at least two a day, uh, 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 you know, that, that we insist and adequate amount of water with every, um, every kind of meal. Okay. So that is what we insist among children. Okay. And uh, Alex, let's get on to the topic at hand. How do we uh, recognize or rather how do we describe abnormal eating behaviors? So uh, abnormal eating behaviors are um, a distorted um, approach to to eating and a, a rela distorted relationship with food. Um, so it is uh, often either a compulsive uh, form of eating or an inflexible mindset towards food, um, and uh, it is it has a that has a biological component, it has a social component, and a psychological component. So these three are uh, the three things the, that uh, together. Uh, build up and uh, uh, lead the person into having a distorted approach. Um, we recognize um, five or six main most common eating disorders actually in people. Um, so the most common one maybe is probably anorexia for everyone. Um, bulimia is another one, binge eating, um, bigorexia, and orthorexia. So if we define each one of them, anorexia is, uh, a, is the person has a distorted image of herself. Um, so uh, there is a huge fear of gaining weight and of uh, becoming overweight. So they're very often underweight. Bulimia is uh, a person that has um, the, the, the necessity of eating lot quantities and then behind just right after tries to purge or to vomit the quantity that uh, she has intaken because it's too big and there is this sense of guilt with it. Uh, binge eating is uh, defined as a um, it's similar to bulimia. The person eats huge quantities, but the quantities are even bigger and they're limited in a two hour period. And um, until actually the person feels physical pain from the quantity of food that has been eaten. 
So uh, th there is a slight difference with bulimia. And in this condition of binge eating, when the person is so uh, physically in pain from having eaten too much, she either purges herself, so gets rid of the food eaten, or does not. Uh, the last two was bigorexia and orthorexia. And these are more modern. They have appeared lay more lately. Um, and bigorexia is a, a, a condition in which a person is up with her muscle and her body. So it is a constant search of trying to build muscle and to have a perfect body shape. And uh, it becomes uh, really obsessive and it hurts physically the body because the body cannot take uh, six to seven to eight hours of exercise daily. Mm -hmm. And finally, orthorexia is... Uh, um, a situation in which the person is really obsessed by the quality of food and so limits herself to certain foods only and uh, is really obsessive. The quality of food is uh, something that is uh, constantly in her mind and there are lots of food that are not uh, accepted and um, it is also very limiting and inflexible approach to, to eating. Mm. And uh, especially in today's day and age where we are also... Uh, driven by social media, uh, right? So this body image issue and then eating because you want to fit into what society accepts as beautiful or what society accepts for that matter. And that also is kind of, I think, affecting people when it comes to their eating behaviors, eating patterns, right? So Samita, in your own experience, do you see any of these uh, eating issues in the, uh, you know, in the, in the children who come to you? children and teenagers for that matter yeah actually uh, eating problems or let's say as you know as we put it as you know disordered uh, eating can occur uh, even at between uh, 1 to 5 years of age group because that time the the children are acquiring their you know the the schedule the the uh, proper eating habits so it could be just uh, like you know they would eat only one one thing and not eat uh, other uh, other part of the of a balanced diet so these come in that age group again the more commonest one that we see is the the you know pubertal and or the pubertal age group around from 12 to 25 uh, kind of age group or for me it is um, less than about 7 18 so yeah that's the most commonest we are seeing and um, it's it's quite um, uh, alarming you know in in uk and all, all over as well about we uh, we see about quite a 0.5% uh, which is increased uh, in the last 5 uh, years to 84% of uh, you know teenagers are having uh, this uh, this any type of they fit in any type of uh, this this the uh, eating disorders that alex was talking about so that is quite alarming. And also the hospital admissions also have gone up uh, currently with that. Are you saying there's an 84% increase in the number of uh, hospital admissions or hospital visits because of abnormal or, like you said, disordered eating? No, not hospital visits, but uh, diagnosis. There has been an increase uh, of 84% of increase in the diagnosis of of an eating disorder and hospital visits have also gone up to almost double. Alex, coming back to you, why would these eating behaviors, these kind of disorders develop in people? Is it genetic? Is it environmental? Or is it because of peer pressure? Um, as I said, the factors are psychological, social, and biological. So what we mean is that, of course, the, the, the psychological component is probably the most important one. So as uh, Sumita mentioned, is the is the um, uh, image that we have conveyed of the body of perfection, uh, of body shape, etc. So the physical appearance, and but there are also situations of trauma, of parents divorcing, of bullying at school, of uh, sense of not belonging to a group, uh, again, because of uh, social media images that are conveyed. Um, and uh, often low self-esteem is also present. To this, we have the biological 
a component of there is apparently a gene predisposition that uh, so certain genes that can be triggered and turned on. Um, and there is obviously the component of puberty, of, uh, as Sumita mentioned too. And um, what I see a lot is also um, the, the start of uh, uh, restrictions in dieting and things like that, and the bad habits that have been already uh, there uh, since uh, early childhood. And those are also factors that uh, contribute to this development of these disorders. So of course, um, when one starts dieting and putting caloric restrictions to one's meals, um, you start developing a distorted relationship with food and uh, it degenerates into, into an eating disorder. Because what we have to understand in these eating disorders is not that it comes from one day to another. It's uh, like a continuum. So it's a, a slow and gradual degradation uh, the, with the relationship to food. So before, uh, when we should start, we should, if we start ideally with a person that has a normal relationship with food and is happy with their uh, body appearance and has no particular issue there, then it does a slight degradation. I start thinking we're a little bit too round and we want to try and lose weight. And so it's a gradual thing that ends up into and degenerates into a, an eating disorder. Yeah. So as I said, there are lots of factors, psychological, uh, social, social media, the image, the wanting to resemble a, a perfect body shape. And um, obviously a genetic, uh, there is apparently some kind of genetic um, presence there too. Okay. Yeah, because I heard a lot of teenagers, when, like when you just walk on the road, when there are teenagers walking, they be like, you know what, my thighs are so fat or my thighs are so big. And you look at that person, she looks totally perfect. So I don't know from where that idea that the thighs are so big uh, is coming up. The other thing I know for a fact is that bullying affects because uh, like most people who've heard me talk before, it, I've had childhood obesity, right? So bullying went on right from, I think the time I was in nursery school, right? Even in medical school, I was either called names, maybe as a jest, but it's still a name that you're called, right? So bullying does affect the way you perceive food and the way you have a relationship with food. Yeah. And, uh, Samita, how would parents yeah. uh, recognize that their ch child has an issue with food? How would parents recognize it? Yeah, uh, actually, there are some uh, some some kids will come up with uh, rigid rituals and routines and preoccupation with food and exercise. So, excessive exercise, not eating, skipping meals. And uh, most important, altered body image and perception of body weight. Uh, perfectly what we would think is normal for that age, the weight. Uh, teenagers might perceive them as they are overweight because, again, as you said, a lot of factors, bullying, peer pressure. So society uh, tells you to look, you know, the, the social media, um, the definition of beautiful uh, then again during this time also you know modeling uh, who are taking up professions for modeling they are more prone um, and even the gymnasts the ballet dancers so yeah uh, coming to your question of uh, how you know parents are going to recognize so yeah I mean what we are first we have to deal with the uh, meals they are skipping meals as I said and on top of it, then again, feelings of guilt and shame once they've eaten that, you know, they have eaten um, this amount of food today, uh, dinner or lunch. And they have this notion that they have to go and, you know, exercise um, more or skip another, skip the dinner that day. This feeling and then feeling of, you know, loss of control with food. And, uh, of course, a bit more, there is uh, episodes of fainting, dizziness, tiredness, fatigue. Then uh, the reports from the teachers that the student is not able to focus, concentrate and work. Uh, all these come in. And then the physical signs, for example, you know, they are faint if, 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 the, if the children or the mainly females are the most affected in the eating disorders. So, I mean, if there's a 
episodes of fatigue and fainting, then probably they are taken down to the accident and emergency here, and then some blood workup is done. And then you find out there's um, anemia. And then, it, you know, then it goes on. And uh, those the other physical signs are more uh, the, related to doctors rather than parents, I would say. Yeah. So it's the way your child is reacting to food, food timings, being very picky about what they eat, uh, and also very, very conscious about how food is going to uh, affect their appearance, isn't that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, another thing is that um, when you talked about calories, Alex, uh, I realized that because initially, every time I went to a dietitian, they would tell me 1,200 calories or 1,400. I remember somebody telling me 1,100 calories. And obviously, in those days, we never had food apps. So I would put it all on an Excel sheet or sit down and calculate everything. And this is even before Excel sheet. So I would sit down and calculate everything, what I was eating. And if I went from 1,100 to 1,200 calories, I would be filled with guilt I'm like oh my gosh you know like I undid everything that I was uh, trying to do with regards to losing weight and my health and all of that but yeah that does cause some serious negative relationship with food and uh, again if we don't have a good relationship with food food is not going to nourish us I think uh, right I think we are in agreement with that um Alex okay. yeah. Alex what are the dangers of this kind of uh, eating disorders? Is there any danger or are we just making a big noise about it? Uh, it is very dangerous. Uh, it is the first cause of death uh, among the psychological uh, problems that a person can have. So it is the first cause of death. Uh, the danger is there because it also happens mostly in teenagers and children or that are uh, entering puberty because their body changes. So that is really a huge trigger very often. And it is a fragile population because their adolescence is already uh, a difficult moment in life of a person. So when it is adds up with that, um, it is really um, it can lead easily to depression or uh, social retrieval, and that's another thing to watch when one tries to detect if something is going on. Obviously, as Sumita said, the behavior at the table, the weight shift can be an indication, but social retrieval, depression, anxiety, those are also things that manifest uh, in a person. And uh, um, it is dangerous, of course, also from a healthy point of view, because uh, the body can have deficiencies and um, and uh, there are conditions that uh, anorexia when some there are cases in which it is not possible to get out of it. So it's important to keep an eye and to try and detect them as soon as possible in order to help the person go back to a normal relationship to food. Um, another thing that needs mentioning probably is also the tooth decay that happens with these conditions because when the person makes herself uh, um, purge through vomiting, the teeth are impacted negatively by the acidity that comes out uh, from, the, from the food that was previously eaten. So if there is a suspicion, a good thing would be to, yeah, a dentist uh, consultation and checking out if there is some tooth decay. So um, uh, there is this psychological component that is uh, dangerous with a person that has eating disorders and obviously the healthy physical component of deficiencies and uh, and uh, issues like that, well, anemia and vitamin deficiencies and mineral deficiencies that come from a um, distorted eating uh, behavior. Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of... Uh adults or even children or teenagers can land up in emergency right in hospital emergency because of things like anorexia or bulimia where there's a lot of el electrolyte imbalance and mineral and vitamin deficiency so definitely landing up in the casualty is something that you may be seeing uh, the other thing is that uh, when it comes to eating disorders which has developed at a young age Many of us don't realize that it goes with you right into adulthood. So there may be so many adults who have eating disorders, but they are scared to come out and talk about it because obviously they think it's a reflection of who they are as a person. Samvita, is there anything you want to add, uh, you know, where our audience can 
know a little more about bulimia and anorexia amongst people or amongst the children and teenagers that you see in the clinic? So anorexia is one of the most life-threatening kind of eating disorder. Uh, it has the highest mortality rate among all the uh, eating disorders. So yes, it and in anorexia, as Alex has already mentioned, there is um, a trio of very low uh, weight and then they have an intense fear of putting on weight and they have a severely uh, negative perception of body weight and body shape. So on top of the uh, signs that I said among, you know, parents can pick up, so it can go up to severe dehydration, as you were talking about, uh, you know, girls, or the, the teenagers going up to a &E because of severe dehydration, dizziness, as I said, fainting episodes. On top of that, they uh, come with, you know, hair. They could, there could be hairs which come out, fall out, brittle uh, hairs, then brittle bones. So bony pains because uh, minerals and, you know, vitamins are deficient, hence they will have osteoporosis. So the reduced bone density, muscle mass is lost. And again, kidney failure because of severe dehydration. So these are kind of, kind of the medical complications that they can go into. And uh, uh, according to the statistics, about 10% of them, uh, you know, irrespective and regardless of the age, they would actually uh, die as a suicide. So... So that is also very, very scary. And uh, treatment wise, they can go up, the treatment can go up to lifelong. So that is the support they uh, would need. And uh, more than five years, about, uh, you know, 20 to 30% of them need more than five years of, or more than 50% actually, need more than five years of treatment. And the another um, aspect would be that if any sibling or relative or a family member has an eating disorder, so these um, teenagers are much, much more prone, about seven to 12 times more prone to have another of this kind of uh, uh, eating disorder. Mm -hmm. Samita, help me to understand a little better. Does everybody yeah. with anorexia or bulimia have weight loss as an indicator? Because I know that we hear about actresses with bulimia or anorexia, but um, most of them don't look like they are very underweight and things like that. They, they do look very slim because they are like in movies and things like that, but they don't seem to be skeletal or anything. So is weight loss something that is always associated with eating behaviors with anorexia and bulimia? No, anorexia, there is there is weight loss, significant weight loss. Almost, uh, we say about 70%, uh, you know, uh, and BMI less than 15. Almost that is the criteria for any admission or recognition of kind of uh, anorexia. But bulimia, there is uh, there's actually, it could be normal weight. Uh, so there, there is no significant weight loss. But in bulimia, what happens, there is um, binge eating and then there is a uh, purge. So, which is like they would want to get rid of the food that has been consumed. So, they are um, either doing it by self-induced vomiting. They could use laxatives, diuretics. So, all those, um, then they will have water fasting. Uh, they, so, all these, with all these methods, they try and uh, get rid of the guilt that they have eaten and they have put on weight and with all this method they try to get uh, rid psychologically of the fact that you know they have eaten and they should get rid of the food so that is the difference bulimia uh, there's no significant weight loss weight could be normal but in bulimia uh, these things are more important as um, Alex already said then there is a teeth enamel loss because of acid erosion so again a dentist appointment then bones is, and then yes there's knuckle pigmentation and thickening of the knuckles because they try and put their you know hand in their in their mouth to for self-induced vomiting. Mm -hmm. So uh, these uh, factors are important. Again, bulimia, uh, you know, the treatment can be, it can go on for more than five to 10 years in 50 to 60% of the cases. 
and also uh, for both these eating disorders mm, you need a lot of support and uh, behavioral therapy as well um, yeah i'm pretty uh, like i'm pretty shocked at the number of teenagers i have seen going on to juice fasts or you know cleansing fasts because they feel that they need to lose weight um, and like you said it's uh, it's a sign that parents need to look for and see whether their children are crossing over into you know it's not just a little bit of i want to look good and i want to look slim and all of that but whether it's actually becoming a disorder and uh, yeah so alex uh, what would you need like to add when it comes to bulimia anorexia or any other kind of negative or disordered eating um nothing much to me i think sumita has said most of it uh, i just want to underline again two important things the fact that the weight doesn't necessarily needs to be the indication of a disorder it can be a normal weight so that is really an important thing because it can mislead very often and secondly it has those conditions have to be recognized as pathologies as illnesses the person needs to be taken care of psychologically by specialized people because and um that sometimes parents may tend to think okay my daughter is just picky and she's not eating she's just being difficult she's not being difficult to her eating is painful because there are different uh, circuits in the brain that are not working the same correct way if you want so um it, it they had they need a, a psychological support it needs to be recognized and it does not help to say okay eat please you have to eat it will do you good because that is not the right approach to it um because eating is painful as i said it's really a psychological um, noise they call it a mental noise when they eat it's really disturbing um so what helps a lot what we can do as the, i can do as a nutritionist uh, and not being a psychological is accompany the psychological help and helping the anorexic person in preparing their meals because knowing what will happen knowing what they will eat at me at the meal helps them acknowledge it cope with the fear and cope with the mental noise that and the pain that comes from the eating so uh, there is no more intuition there is no more lightedness around meals it has to be prepared it has to be uh, if you want logical oriented um and uh, really it demands an effort but it's one of the only approaches that uh, works with anorexic people okay so how do you differentiate between a bad eating habit versus an eating disorder well the the psychological component uh, is uh, is definitely number 1 uh, a person with an eating disorder uh, apart from all the problems that we've mentioned before is socially retrieved from society cannot participate in the same way because either she's occupied with a binge eating uh, manifestation or she's scared to go to a restaurant and eat or she's occupied doing sports and uh, building her muscles so it's social retrieval is depression is low esteem it's a psychological factors take over uh in bad eating habits the person can be might as well be happy and um, find it comforting to have uh, habits eating habits that are not uh, maybe the best ones but uh, there is no social component to their psychological component there's maybe um just um the fact that she's unhappy and trying to lose weight maybe but uh, it's it's totally different the, the approach to food is not so distorted. The self-image of the person is not distorted in well, somebody like that said, only has bad. Like you said earlier in the beginning of the video, so maybe things like sitting down and, uh, you know, sitting down in front of the TV while eating, uh, playing games on the phone or looking at your messages when you're eating. Uh, what else would you look at um, not having specific times for eating? Not that you need to have it at a specific time, but not having enough gap between uh, meals, right? And uh, stop yes. eating, which is something I spoke about while I, before I introduced both of you. So is there anything else that people need to understand are bad eating habits? 
because even habits have an effect on our health, right? About especially those who have metabolic issues and hormonal issues. If there are bad eating habits, then that's going to derail all their other efforts. Yeah, yeah. The bad eating habits, as we said, is a risk factor that, that can lead into a disordered eating. So bad eating habits, as you said, uh, is not having meal hours and not sitting at a table as a family. But we also are recognizing now uh, uh, the role of the parents in educating their children as um, sometimes leading into bad eating habits. For example, the parents that are obliging children to finish their dish, they're actually interfering with the um, innate sense of the society that the children has so it does lead to a disorder uh, eating a bad eating habit and eventually to an eating disorder so when the child is has not is not able to finish the dish because he's full it, there's no obligation to have the child finish the, the dish absolutely um also the the tr giving food as a treat for a good behavior or good reinforcing behavior that's very wrong too like you get a candy or you've had a nice grade so i'm giving you an ice cream or i'm you helped me i don't know um do something a whore at home and then so you get to eat i don't know something in front of the tv so this association of food with um with um oh, wow. with Comfort makes it become a comfort food, and that leads to a distorted relationship with food again. Um, so this treat of for a, for reinforcing positive habit is very wrong too. Obviously, eating in front of TV or iPads are also uh, what we see very often now. Um, is this habit of giving an iPad to the kid that eats at the restaurant with the parents or uh, with other friends so that the parents can have a, a pleasant meal, just the two of them, and the kids occupy themselves with an iPad. That is also something that is not normal. We are at a dinner table to enter, you know, to have uh, um, a relationship with everyone and to exchange uh, um, whatever happened during the day. So it's a mo moment of... Um, of um, of connection for everyone and putting the kid on the side with the iPad, the child does not chew anymore, does not realize what he's eating, he's not appreciating the food and often leads also to a situation of boredom and they start not wanting to eat or eating, you know, inappropriately and, and turning themselves and, and rolling themselves on the seats and it actually increases boredom rather than anything and um, the kid that has no idea whatever he has eaten, how much he has eaten, if he has listened to his body and his society or not. And this actually is really uh, the beginning of a distorted relationship to food. You, the first step is to really listen and be attentive and mindful when one eats. So this is really, really important to stay at a dinner table with the children and talk to them and have a relationship with them instead of giving them an iPad and associating TVs and other distraction to the moment of eating. In fact, and no, uh, um, no, no sorry, carry on. Uh, sorry, mm. and then also, um, they, there's also a loss. Has been a loss into helping the moms uh, in the kitchen. The kids need to come and help because this way they also secrete the digestive enzymes. They prepare their body and their brain to the moment of uh, accepting food and of digesting and of enjoying it. And this thing of calling the children that have been in front of a TV again, they come and eat a little bit at dinner table and just leave before the dinner is finished is also totally wrong. Dinner has to be a family thing and they have to help uh, their parents. And, um, and finally, the last thing that I've seen, and it is also something that is wrong, is that Parents eat something different from the children or they even lie on the content because the kid doesn't like broccoli or vegetables and we lie to the children. Oh, it's not vegetable. It's something that they like. Mm -hmm. um, and that's totally uh, disrupting because obviously the child has to eat the same thing. Why would he eat something different from the parent? Mm -hmm. They take example and they mimic what we do. So we have to give the example of sitting at a dinner table, of eating properly, of chewing, of having a conversation and not being on our phones, yes. of eating the same thing and of saying, okay, you don't like it, just try. You don't like it. It doesn't matter. We'll try it next week. Mm -hmm. You don't like it still. We'll try it again next week. And you propose and propose regularly the same food that maybe the child does not like without forcing it mm -hmm. and eating you too. Because if you don't eat the broccoli, 
there's no way you can force a child. It's not fair to force a child into eating the broccoli. And all these behaviors, they in the end, they seem they might seem light, but in the end, they actually build up into a distorted be uh, relationship to food. Hmm. The other thing is, I think Saumita and I were discussing in one of the previous videos that food is not reward. So food discussion discussion about food as a reward should be off the table you give something else to reward the child but not food as a reward not your donut and not your ice cream because you did well and things like that and in a uh, in addition to that what you said when the child is in the kitchen helping and in and here i i say we don't just look at the girl child helping we have to look at even boys coming into the kitchen and helping the mother or the father with the cooking because it is so important it's today it is not just about uh, okay eating at the table and learning how to cook but it's also survival because children need to go out into the world at some point of time and then uh, they shouldn't start depending on restaurants because that's another thing that we see children are leaving home by the time they are 18 20 and then they're just living off restaurant food because they don't know how to cook and again we are setting a uh, not so good uh you know uh president over there by not teaching our children about cooking simple foods at least right um uh, and in addition to what you said these kind of negative eating behaviors uh can go on to become eating disorders and uh, sometimes it goes right into adulthood because we've not recognized it when the person was in their teens right and uh then we have this additional problem that people don't want to come out and talk about it because they're embarrassed. They feel that it reflects upon them uh, or their character and things like that. So mm -hmm. identifying eating patterns, if you are not on the right track uh, and if you're not able to kind of uh, break out of a negative eating pattern, you need to take help. Would you agree with that? Completely. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, and it has to be like a, the, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, as Alex was saying, so you know, the food, the men, the children could be, you know, um, incorporated in the menu. Like they, they should be talking about in their food choices, the what they want to eat in that uh, week's menu, and you know their interest. You you can put them also among uh, the preparation of food, so their interest will grow. They would also want to know more about. The healthier choices and you discuss also the not so healthy choices with them and the consequences of those so it 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 has to be kind of a healthy relationship not battles over food i mean that is one of the things that we have to avoid battles and then the parents have to be known models as alex was saying because early stages we can mold the child and into good eating habits and then then it the progress to teenage uh, and adolescent uh, disordered eating would be less. So we are actually curtailing the incidence of, again, eating disorders in adulthood if we are uh, taking them early in the in their age group and inculcating the good eating habits as we put on. You know? Yeah, like uh, in what you said, we can't tell the child have water on the side when you're having a meal in case you want to kind of uh, you know, swallow the food. Yeah. You have a Coke or a Diet Coke. I oh, think absolutely. That's, that's a total conflict in the child's mind, right? Yeah. How can we uh, recognize the difference between a person who has eating issues, for example, binge eating because they have a leptin or an insulin issue versus binge eating because it is a psychological issue? How do we differentiate between those? Um, well, there are um, the, 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 the storm eating. So the binge eating is something that gets out of control, right? So the person eats and cannot stop. And, and then there is, uh, the, there's this, of this uh, as we said, psychological component, and there is a lot of guilt and uh, uneasiness to admit it. It's really, there's this guilt behind it that is very predominant. When you talk about leptin resistance, that is a metabolic function. So that is a really 
really impaired by the type of diet that we've had. And that is, there's no really a, a physical, psychological component. It's just the, the, um, the type of diet that we have had through the, through our life that was, um, that has led to the metabolic, uh, if you want, um, the, this metabolic situation. So that would be a leptin resistance, uh, where, um, we have been used to eating maybe empty calories. So sugary food and high glycemic food and things like that. And maybe sleep is also impaired. And so this is really more linked to habits uh, of a modern life, if you want. And then there is a third thing uh, that is also a, phys a, phys a physical um, uh, disruption is that when we have congenital leptin deficiency. So that is uh, really a problem of hormonal deficiency at birth. And that is totally different too. And that we recognize that because the baby is or the very young kid uh, eats enormously because the leptin hormone, when it is deficient, there is no society, um, if you want message that goes through. So the, the baby or the child is always angry, hungry and eats a uh, huge quantities. But that is a, a really a physical issue and there's a deficiency. And so uh, it's uh, it can be sold supplementing with leptin. So these three are three different uh, situations. And uh, the, as we said, the binge eating is a psychological one. And uh, it's that has to be treated totally differently from the other two, which uh, one is a, a, a supplementation of leptin. The other one is healthy eating habits, is uh, taking on board a different type of diet. No, they're different. A lot of times, if uh, blood work and uh, lab diagnosis will also help, right, to identify uh, whether there is a hormonal issue or whether it is a psychological issue, right? Of course. Yeah. Yes. So, Samhita, and later on you, Alex, can you uh, give our audience some examples of what you have handled in your private practice where eating behavior or eating disorders are concerned? I mean, uh, hospital, uh, if you, uh, I, because I'm in the hospital, so I, I'm going to talk about the hospital admissions, if if you like, about, uh, that's what, that was what I was saying, that about 25% of all the hospital admissions in UK has been in, uh, if from the last five years, in the year of 2018, to 19 i'm just saying it is for eating disorders so it has been it's that that kind of um, intensity as we are looking at and um, i have had uh, in my in the um, if i'm going to talk about the last 5 years so i have seen about 6 7 cases of anorexia which has needed treatment and is ongoing treatment even after 5 years so, and it has typically come with your um, fainting episodes and also very frequent illnesses and which are not getting um, completely uh, recovery, uh, recovered. So because of decreased immune uh, system response, their illnesses are not getting frequently uh, totally uh, treated and they get a, again ill more frequently than other adolescents also healing healing is if there's a wound for example in the in the field they have got a wound while they're playing sports healing is quite delayed and that also sometimes triggers um like why it is and then we link it up the blood work as you were told, telling that links up and then we have to take a bit of history and uh, yes, this is this I have seen in the past uh, five years in the hospital admissions about, uh, as I said, more than five years still ongoing treatment. They are on treatment. Yeah. I hope this discussion has helped our viewers understand what eating habits and eating disorders are. So before we come to the end of this video, uh, Alex, could you just briefly summarize what are normal eating habits and what are poor or bad eating habits? Yes, sure. Um, so we have to understand that uh, good uh, normal eating habits are habits um, where the family unites herself and eats at the dinner table, uh, sitting down in front of a cooked and prepared 
uh, dish. It is um, obviously what is um, this entails is that we eat, we are mindful about what we eat, we are chewing, we are appreciating the food, we have a normal appetite and we don't uh, either skip half of the meal, say with the pretext of trying to reduce the number of calorie intake, or we're not just standing up all the time or leaving the, din the, the table, the dinner table before the lunch is finished. So it's just a, a normal eating at the table, mindfully, calmly chewing and taking time without of interacting with the people at the table. No screens, no TV, no phone, and no individual, if you want, uh, um, eating individually, even if sitting at the same table. So uh, also having a uh, sufficient interruption in between meals to do, to permit the body to digest and the rest and to feel again hungry. The idea of heal, feeling hungry is very important. And while we're eating, the idea of feeling uh, fullness is very important also. So this is globally the, the normal eating habit. What is a poor eating habit would be eating all day long, small quantities, being always hungry, not listening to our body and our appetite. So overeating or under eating, um, not preparing foods and always having uh, something on the go really rapidly, walking and eating or working in front of the screen and eating. So exactly, obviously of the opposite of what I said before. Um, it is important to keep preparing meals, to eat uh, good quality food, that is um, used to prepare and cook and uh, stop uh, having uh, always um, the easy uh, solution of eating something that is prepared, that is transformed, that has lots of fats and uh, sugars mixed in it. So really going back a little bit to what the habits of our ancestors were. Um, also, it is important to remember that bad eating habits start at day one of life or almost. <laughs> so when the child starts eating on its own solid food, that's when we have to start uh, um, introducing good eating habits because we see it is most uh, more and more common also in children. So it is something that the parents need to be aware of and to really uh, incorporate the child into the family uh, habits of eating together and uh, having a normal more relationship with the with the child during eating and it's not feeding them every minute it's not uh, feeding them while we're at the movies while we're shopping if we are doing something we don't need to eat we have to understand that eating is a moment of pleasure with food at moments at definitive times during the day and preferably always the same time okay and uh, samita how would you uh categorize eating disorders so yeah eating disorders are multifactorial and very complex. Uh, they have genetic factors, as we've already discussed, biological, environmental, and the mental health component. So the, the mental health component is what probably, you know, differentiates it from bad, uh, your bad eating, bad eating uh, habits, because here the body image and the body, uh, there's a huge dissatisfaction with the body image, uh, with your own body and with around. So the image that you have, the person that you are in your own body and also about your body shape and body weight. So that is a uh, that is the main factor, I would say. And also world uh, globally, there are about 70 million people who have eating disorders, so which is quite a chunk. So as Alex was saying, it it is, very, very important that we recognize it as an illness because it has got mortality rates and they are quite, quite without treatment. About 20% of all eating disorders end up in death. And also with treatment, they need some, as I have already mentioned, some of them uh, might require lifelong treatment, support, family support, peer, your peers, friends. So it is, as Alex was saying, very important that we recognize this as a grave illness and uh, we have to take more care about this, recognize the signs and symptoms. People themselves have to recognize uh, that they are suffering from an illness and it is not just uh, eating uh, correction. 
uh, it is an illness and it has to be uh, treated with drugs, with the behavioral therapy, with the mental um, psychological factor in it. So it is a multifactorial kind of treatment as well. Okay. So, and if a person has uh, eating habits, which are not so good, uh, they need, they can either correct it themselves or they can have the help of a nutrition coach who will help them identify it and then correct it. But when it comes to eating disorders, then they need to have a medical team who is going to help them address the issue, right? Yeah. So yes, I, absolutely. So I thank both of you, Alex and Samita, for this discussion. And I really hope that uh, people are going to listen to this and they are going to be able to help themselves or, at, or maybe help somebody that they really care about. Um, yeah, and to our viewers, if there are any questions, please put them down in the comments and uh, we will try to answer them to the best of our ability. So once again, thank you for coming on the Wellberry and I look forward to the next discussion that we can have. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.